Hello there, I'm Roger Moore and I'm from the Speech and Hearing Research Group at the University of Sheffield in the UK and I'd like to welcome you to this tutorial at uh, Interspeech 2020. Now obviously I'm very sorry that I'm not able to be there in person to deliver this tutorial. It would have been fantastic to have the opportunity to come to Shanghai. However, the international situation is what it is and we're having to do things differently this year. Uh, so I'd like to thank the organisers for giving me the opportunity to uh, pre-record this tutorial. Um, but I'd also like to thank the organisers for selecting this particular topic. Because, um, as you're well aware, many of the tutorials at Interspeech um, are focusing on the very latest developments, making sure that we're all up to speed with what's going on in our field. But this one is different because this one is going back to basics. We're going to be looking at the fundamentals of speech uh, behaviour um, and reminding you of things that you may be very familiar with, which is great, but if you're not, then this is your opportunity to make sure that you do understand some of the basic principles behind the signal that we're all so fascinated with and keen to work with. So um, let's get the uh, presentation underway. Um, and we're going to... So this is Speech 101, what everyone working on spoken language processing needs to know about spoken language. All right, <clears throat> so just to be clear, um, I'm not going to be dwelling uh, very much at all on how it works uh, in terms of what, what people seem to be doing when they're processing speech in uh, you know, recognition or, or what have you. Um, so it's, uh, that's not the main purpose here. The main purpose is to focus on the properties of spoken language. Um, in order to be sure that we all understand the nature of the signal that we're working with. Uh, these days, many people are working with pre-recorded data sets and you know, off-the-shelf uh, toolkits for classification. They may never get to listen to the signal um, and therefore perhaps fail to appreciate some of the subtleties and important aspects of spoken language. So we're not, most, not really going to be talking about that. We are going to be focusing on this. So I said we don't uh, often listen to actual speech these days, <clears throat> so let's do that. Um, and I um, want to kick off by just pointing out that speech is not just text being read out loud. There's much more going on, and that's what we need to appreciate, understand, model, exploit, uh, what have you. Um, so we're going to kick off by listening to some speech. And what I'm going to play you now is uh, a, 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 an excerpt from an archive that the BBC has created on different voices, particularly different accents. And uh, in fact, the recording I've selected <coughs> was um, was made in Sheffield. So you will, uh, you're about to hear some Sheffield accents, uh, which might be a challenge to you. You might not recognise exactly what people are saying. Um, and you can also look at the automatic subtitles to see what they make of it. So let's listen to some real speech between some young people who are chatting about, uh, in fact, chatting about their accents. You speak normal English with a slight Sheffield accent and you speak dialect. If you were annoyed, would you go into dialect or would you stay in straight English? I'd go into dialect. <laughs> I'd go into dialect. Why? Oh, I don't know. It's just something you made. Just when I get angry, I go, "Why is man a man getting me angry?" Uh, he he will stay in Sheffield and get mad, but I I I don't I don't know why. I just use my dialect because I don't know. It's like when my parents it's probably got it from my parents because when they got mad, they flipped into their dialect as well. So it's probably I just took it from them. But I prefer it. I prefer it for some reason. That's me why. Is it something about the way you, are you able to express yourself better? Yeah, yeah. Less words, less words, but they, they get to the point quick. OK, so I imagine a lot of you might have had some difficulty there. But this is real speech. This is real conversation between people. Um, and there are a lot of interesting things going on. Um, and so I'm now going to just pick out one or two little snippets from what you've just heard. So here's one. With a slight Sheffield accent. So I don't know whether you noticed that, but uh, as she was speaking, she, she made a mistake or she repeated. She, she started the word Sheffield and then stopped and then started again. She, Sheffield. Here's another little snippet. 
<laughs> That's not speech, of course, that, but it is noises that are coming out of people's mouths. And it's, it, it's not irrelevant to the interaction. It's a kind of a crucial part of it. And in fact, they were both doing it at the same time, if you noticed. So it's kind of sympathetic behaviour. Um, so, you know, is that speech? Well, not strictly linguistic, but it's certainly part of the interactive vocal behaviour that's going on. Why? Now, there's a simple word. One word, why. But how expressive was that? Why? OK, uh, we're going to talk later about what's going on with things like this. Well, I, 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 uh, I... I love that bit. Um, if you couldn't make anything out from what he was saying, that's because he didn't say anything. He was talking, uh, but it was meaningless. Um, and essentially what he was doing is, you know, he was holding his uh, turn in the conversation. Um, and while his brain was engaging to think what should say, his mouth was busy saying stuff just to make sure that he didn't lose his turn. Uh, and uh, perfectly normal. You didn't even notice that first time around. Perfectly normal behaviour. I prefer it. I prefer it for some reason. There's a repetition. Yeah. 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 Less words. Less words. Or indeed more words. Uh, so all these things are going on. We don't really notice them. Um, that's the point of the tutorial here. We're going to go into exactly what's happening in all these different uh, interesting situations. Uh, OK. So um, we're going to be touching on lots of different topics. Uh, not, not everything that's listed here, but uh, I just want you to appreciate that speech is a very special, interesting, highly structured um, uh, tool that we use to, to interact. And so it has a lot of different properties, some of which are listed there. More here um, to do with the fact that speech is, you know, is not a necess that's not a private thing. It's something we do in public. Um, we engage in complex environments where many individuals are involved. It's noisy. Um, the, the conversations are grounded. And we're going to touch on some of these things as we go through. Okay, so these, this is actually what, what I'm going to be talking about, <clears throat> the main headings, right? Uh, we need to, first of all, do, uh, understand the, the nature of sound. Speaking and hearing, then uh, some phonetics and some phonology, uh, a little bit about prosody, and then quite a bit at the, at the end about behaviours and some of the interesting things that we've just heard. Um, there will be breaks. Um, and uh, in fact, there are going to be two breaks. So this whole tutorial is split into three. Um, but obviously, since it's pre-recorded, you can stop the video at any time. But uh, there will be some designated points where we will uh, pause. All right. So let's kick off then with sound, the physics of speech. And I'm going to start with this. Right. Sorry to surprise you there, but I, I've always wanted to start to talk with a bang. Um, and there we have it. So, you know, that, that is sound. What, what's, go, what's going on there? So sound is acoustic energy. It's a mechanical wave in a medium. Uh, it could be any medium, but uh, the one that the, what we're interested in, of course, is uh, vibrations in, in the air. And it's a change in air density. And those changes propagate. OK, so that's the basic principle of what's going on. When somebody is speaking, they're vibrating the air and that vibration propagates from speaker to listener. And it propagates quite quickly, 340 uh, metres a second in air. It's faster in water, even faster in a solid. But that's the speed in air. OK, and um, of course, as scientists, we want to measure sound. So we can measure it in various different ways. And here are the three typical ways to measure sound. We can measure the, uh, the evolution of the amplitude of the signal, the sound pressure, over time. And that would mean we'd be looking at things like waveforms. Uh, we might be interested in the energy at different frequencies, in which case we might be measuring spectra. And we might be um, interested in how spectra evolve over time in which case we have a sort of three-dimensional amplitude time frequency plot uh, that we know as a spectrogram. Um, so uh, as we go through, I'm, uh, some of these little warning bubbles will come up. And these are frequent misunderstandings, which I'm highlighting, just to be sure that we're all properly grounded in, in, in the realities here. So um, uh, what I often hear people say, uh, they talk about the frequencies present in a sound. This is, strict, strictly speaking, this is incorrect. 
uh, you know, frequencies don't exist. Frequencies are a property of the sounds. Uh, what you, one should say is that there's energy at different frequencies, a certain amount of energy at a different frequency. Okay, so there'll be little bubbles like this coming up as we go through, which pick up on the on the kinds of things that people typically get wrong or misunderstanding. So if we're going to generate sound, then we need energy. And um, um, so a sound source is, is, is using energy to create those vibrations. And essentially, there are three different types of sound source that we, we can be interested in. There's a, a sudden, um, uh, abrupt um, appearance of energy, which could be an explosion or a hand clap, so, or like, uh, as I played at the beginning. So that's an impulsive sound. OK, so the energy exists. Um, actually, it exists at all frequencies but uh, only for a very short period and it dies away. So you've got spectrograms on the left there showing that. The second class of uh, sound source is a noisy source, so something like the wind or the surf on the beach. Um, essentially, this is random. Um, and there's energy at all frequencies, but it's varying all the time. And that's what we mean by noisy. And then there's a class of sounds which is going to be particularly relevant to us, which is a repetitive sound, which is a buzzing. So you might, it might be the wings of a bee or a, or, a, or a doorbell vibrating. So this has an interesting structure in as much as it, there's energy at what's called the fundamental frequency of the vibration and the harmonics. We're going to come on to that. OK, so these are all different ways in which the sound pressure can vary over time. And a sound source can have all of these at once. They, 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 they're, they're not mutually exclusive. So we, if we have some sound propagating, then um, when the wave encounters... Uh, the physical world, then um, it is changed. Uh, some of the energy will be reflected, some will be absorbed, uh, and that will change the nature of the sound. And it, it behaves, um, uh, acoustic waves in air behave a superposition principle, which is that um, if the waves uh, interfere in an, uh, constructively, then they, they add together and energy is enhanced at uh, those frequencies. Whereas if the uh, energy waves cancel out, that's destructive interference, and we get a reduction of energy. <clears throat> so where the energy is enhanced by a structure, a physical structure, then that is called resonance. And where the energy is uh, absorbed or removed, that is referred to as an anti-resonance. So this applies to all physical objects in the world, but it's quite interesting to consider enclosures because enclosures have some interesting resonant characteristics and they're a function of the shape of the enclosure. Uh, and what uh, that enclosure does is essentially acting as a filter. So these resonances and anti-resonances are a filtering process. So I've got a picture of a muffler there on a car. That's exactly what goes on on an autom on, on a, on a automobile, on a vehicle. Um, the uh, acoustic cavity is designed to provide anti-resonances and remove the sound energy that would otherwise be blasting out of the exhaust. So a simple st structure, like a tube, has a very, very, very simple resonant characteristics. And uh, here they are. So if we've got a tube which is closed at one end and open at the other, then we get resonances at different frequencies. And you can see uh, there uh, in the diagram how those uh, that frequency, those frequencies correspond to the dimensions of the tube. So it's all about how long the tube is. And the, the formula there tells you exactly what the, um, what the relationship is. Um, and you can work out from the uh, size of the length of the tube what the resonant frequencies are. Um, so n there, uh, it, it starts at 1. It's an integer, integer, and if with n equals 1, then you get the frequency of the lowest resonance, which is the picture at the top of the screen. Um, and that is known as the fundamental or fundamental resonance. And then with n, 2, 3, 4, etc., 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 we get the harmonics. And you can see how they are multiples of the fundamental because of the way that the waves fit into the tube. Um, and so the consequence of that is that if you put an input in which is sort of noisy, then the output will be shaped. OK. Um, and if we. Uh, um, so I already said that. Now, what is particularly interesting to us is that the human vocal tract is a tube. 
and it can be very easily approximate, approximated as being closed <coughs> down here in the larynx and open <coughs> here at the mouth. Now, obviously, you can close the mouth, but um, let's say for the moment that it's open. So for an adult male, that's equivalent to a 17 or 17 and a half centimetre tube, which is closed at one end <coughs> and open at the other. We can apply this uh, formula and we get the following resonances. So the first resonance of an adult male vocal tract <coughs> is around 500 hertz. And then the first harmonic is um, uh, at 1500. Uh, then we have a second harmonic at 2400 and a third harmonic at 3500 ish OK. Um, and we can prove that because I, I have here a 17 and a half centimetre tube um, and it's closed at one end and open at the other. And if I put an impulse in, you will hear a particular resonant structure. And if I make my own vocal track the same shape, and if I close the end, OK, so we know that that's a reasonable good model of what's going on. So um, you'll notice I've used the word fundamental here again. Uh, we were talking about the fundamental um, of uh, a repetitive excitation, and here we've got a fundamental of a resonance. This can confuses lots of people. So beware that we're talking about different systems. A sound source is a system. It could be a resonant system. It will have a fundamental frequency. And a, a filter, like a, 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 um, an enclosure, will have resonant properties which shape the sh sound, and that also they also are characterized by a fundamental frequency. So this can be very confusing, but we're just talking about different systems. Okay, so that's a, that's a sound. So now let's move on. We, we were almost there in the last slide. Let's move on to speaking and the sound production system. So... Um, if we take a cross-section through a person, uh, this way, right, then um, obviously we've got um, a bunch of anatomical feature structures which contribute to speaking. And this, uh, known as the vocal apparatus, of course, has uh, primarily evolved for breathing, but it's been recruited for um, other things. Um, I'm, well, uh, breathing and eating is uh, part of the same anatomical structure. And that has allowed uh, animals in general to vocalise and then human beings in particular to speak by recruiting those same structures. If we look at the, um, those structures in a more formal way, in a sort of diagram, then we've got the lungs on the left-hand side, the larynx, the pharynx. Uh, then we, you'll notice there's a split, and that's because the air, uh, the vibrations from your larynx, not only can come out through your mouth through your oral cavity but you've also got a little flap at the back of your mouth which you can open and close and that lets air flow through the nasal cavity and sound can also come out of the nose that little flap is called the velum um, and then we've got the oral cavity in the with the uh, the tongue and the lips and what have you uh, so <clears throat> all, most of the energy is coming from the lungs most of the sound is coming from the larynx, which we'll look at in a moment. And most of the, artic uh, the articulation, that's to say the changing of the sounds, the shaping of the sounds, is coming from the tongue, but not, not entirely. But the tongue is doing most of the work. So again, let's look at a cross-section uh, of the anatomy. And um, I, I draw your attention here. Uh, I, I'm not going to run this up now, but you, uh, please go to this uh, website. Um, and check out this uh, lovely MRI of a speaking vocal tract, and you'll be amazed at the uh, activity that you can see in real time in that video. Really fantastic to see. Uh, but first of all, <coughs> we're going to move to the bottom of the system here, where the most of the energy is coming from, and that's the voice source, the vocal cords. So here's a picture of the vocal cords. <coughs> so basically we've got this narrow slit uh, between... Uh, uh, held, held like this, and air from the lungs is pushed up through this slit. Now, if the slit is held together tightly, the air can't escape. The pressure builds up 
<coughs> and eventually there is the, the, the uh, vocal cords or vocal folds are forced apart, a burst of air comes out, and then they slap shut. And this is uh, caused by the Bernoulli effect. And it's that slapping shut which puts energy into the, vibrates the air, puts a pulse of energy into the system. And of course, it's doing that at regular intervals. As the air pressure is maintained, so the vocal cords are vibrating, they're clapping together at a particular rate, generating a kind of buzzy sound. <clears throat> okay, so I've said, uh, I've said quite a bit of this. We've got air pressure behind the vocal folds. They're forced apart, uh, producing the what's known as phonation, the vibration caused by the uh, air passing through those elastic uh, membranes. Um, so if the muscles on uh, uh, holding those tighten, you create more tension and the pitch of the, so the, the frequency of vibration will change. It will, if you increase the tension, the, vi the frequency will go up. And if you lower the tension, the frequency will go down. And, if you lower, and you can also hold them open, in which case there's no vibration at all. Now, it is an important point. This is not a pure tone. OK, if you've got all this clapping going on, this is this is not the equivalent of, of, of like a whistle. This this is this is a, 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 a signal which has many impulses and therefore it has energy at the fundamental frequency of vibration and all the harmonics. So it's a very what we call a harmonic rich signal. Um, so here's a little warning. Uh, I'm using the term vocal folds here interchangeably with vocal cords. But um, just note it's vocal cord, C-O-R-D. It's not C-H-O-R-D, which is a musical term. Nothing to do with the vocal cords. And lots of students, I notice, make a mistake there. OK, um, now here's another little warning. Um, that uh, fundamental frequency at the larynx, uh, I'm sure most of you will have heard, the, heard this referred to as F0. <clears throat> it's most common term. However, it is potentially misleading for reasons which will come up in a minute because it's, it's not a resonance <coughs> of the oral cavity. So it's uh, not the zeroth rev resonance of that cavity um, because in a minute we're going to be talking about F1 and F2. So um, an alternative term which is preferable um, and what I was taught when I was doing my phonetics at University College London is to use the term FX. However, not many people do. But it does mean that if you use the term FX, it makes it very clear that you're talking about the fundamental uh, frequency of vibration of the vocal folds and not a, anything to do with the resonance of the cavities. OK, so that's the voice source. So we'll now very quickly move up to what's called the voice filter. Which of these cavities up here? The oral cavity, the nasal cavity, the, the pharyngeal cavity, which is right at the back. Everything that's basically above the vocal cords. So, the vocal tract forms a resonator, just like we saw with the, the tubes before. And the resonances in the vocal tract have this special name. They're known as formants. Not format, formants. So a formant is a resonance in a vocal tract. Not only humans, it could be uh, any other animal which has a similar anatomy. All, all mammalian systems are the same. Um, so those, those resonances have this special name. And then the speech is altered by moving articulators, right? Um, you heard that the primary articulator is the tongue. So as the tongue is dancing around in the oral cavity in particular, it's changing the shape of that cavity and therefore it's changing the resonances and therefore the formants, uh, the resonant frequencies, are moving. Um, OK, uh, it's, it's a resonant cavity, but it's changing. Um, and it's the tongue that's mostly doing it but um, some of the other articulators are involved as well. So here we have <clears throat> what's called the excitation spectrum. So this is the signal from your larynx when, when the vocal cords are vibrating. And if you put a microphone on the larynx, uh, it sounds like this. No, it doesn't. <laughs> um, it's, it's coming in a second. So we've got the uh, fundamental frequency uh, which is the lowest uh, um, uh, thing on the plot there, where we've got energy at the lowest for a frequency, and then we have all these harmonics. And fingers crossed, it sounds like this.
Right, I'll play that again. So just to be clear, that is a, a recording right at the larynx, and it just it literally sounds like a buzz, and that's exactly what it is. So there's energy at the fundamental frequency, FX, and also a, a decreasing amount of energy as you go up through the harmonics. So that's the excitation spectrum. But now we're going to feed that into the resonant properties of a vocal tract. And now we see we've got enhancement at some frequencies and depression at others. So we're shaping. So the oral cavity is shaping it. We've still got the fundamental frequency and the harmonics, <clears throat> but the harmonics, it's the harmonics that we're interested in now. It's the harmonics are illuminating the shape of the spectral. Uh, the spectral shape of the vocal tract, so, right? It's the energy of all the different harmonics now, which is telling us essentially what the properties of the uh, uh. cavity are. And now we've got a recording of that same vowel at the mouth. Uh. No longer sounds like a simple buzz. You can now hear the shaping and it sounds like a vowel, of course, not surprisingly. Um, and so we can smooth that. And this is what's known as the sp smoothed spectrum envelope and we can see the peaks and troughs and the peaks have these special names because they correspond to the resonances they are the formants the lowest one is called f1 the next one is called f2 f3 f4 and there's an infinite set but they get uh, uh, lower and lower energy so now you can see why <clears throat> it's important to distinguish fx from f1 and f2 and f3 because um that is the fundamental frequency of vibration of the vocal cords. It's not anything to do with the resonances. So strictly speaking, it shouldn't be called F0. Um, another thing that's worth noting here is that the spec we're often uh, we're interested in the smooth spectrum and we're interested in picking formats sometimes. Um, and uh, it's very important to note that the, that's that's very challenging, and the reason it's challenge uh, formand estimation is challenging is because the harmonics may not co coincide with the actual resonant uh, properties of the cavity, um, especially if the uh, fundamental frequency is high, like in a child's voice, for example. All those harmonics will be spread out, okay. And that means that, you know, one of the resonances may have no energy at all because there happens not to be a harmonic there. So this, if you've always wondered why, why is format tracking so hard, that's one of the reasons. OK, so this is um, old news. Um, you know, this was studied many, many years ago and a classic study by Peter Ladefoged, um, no, sadly no longer with us. Um, uh, big, big, uh, big player in phonetics in the in the field, um, and from his book *Elements of Acoustic Phonetics*, um, he had plotted the different shapes of the oral cavity and the, therefore the diff different resonant characteristics. And so, to remind you, the peaks in the overall spectral envelope are the resonances, and they're the formants. And in this particular example of the OR vowel, we've got an F1 and an F2 uh, sitting right there. OK, so we can simulate um, the vocal tract because it's a, a simple resonator and we can do that. I, you, I, you, you saw the tube earlier um, and so I can bring out my tube again. And, but also I've got a vibrator, um, which is an electrolarynx. And if I put my electrolarynx into my 17 centimeter tube, that's exactly the same as me doing this. OK. Um, but uh, thanks to um, Takeyuki Arai, um, who has published um, specifications for 3D printing um, different uh, vocal tract shapes, I had a student actually print these out. And so this is actually the shape of an R. And here we've got a shape of an E. That's t so basically we've got the larynx here and the lips here, and this is just representing the shape that you make with your tongue. And here we've got an A. Or an A, more like an A sound. Um, and of course I can, I can um, not only do that with my vocal tract. Um, but I can also talk to you and you can understand what I'm saying. There you go. And of course people who have problems with their larynx will use an electrolarynx to be able to converse with other people. 
OK, so um, a lot of em emphasis on the larynx, but um, the vibration of the vocal folds is not the only source of sound in the vocal tract. We can also make noises. So what we're doing there is we're creating a constriction. Our articulators are getting very close together. Turbulence, uh, you, that creates turbulent airflow, which is essentially noise. And we're shaping that noise. We can also, you remember the impulsive sounds, there's another different type of sound. We can generate that by, for example, completely closing our vocal tract and then opening it again. So, um, is a complete closure. Uh, we also we have repetitive sound, of course, coming from the larynx, but we can also create repetitive sound by vibrating one of the other articulators, as in Okay? Um, and we can, in fact, generate a pure tone by getting one of the, resona one of the um, resonances to just resonate on its own. And that's what you're doing when you're whistling. That's actually second format, resonating, and we're exciting it with a little bit of noise, turbulence, um, and the resonance itself is just is then oscillating and you're getting pretty much a pure tone. Right, um, now I want to show you something because um, uh, the vocal tract is capable of making all kinds of amazing sounds, all the sounds of all the languages in the world and some of the sounds in different languages are very exotic um, but uh, you, you can't get much more exotic than beatboxing. So let me um, show you this from University College. It's quite, uh, quite something. OK, well, I hope you enjoyed that. And the, 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 it's on YouTube, so if you want to check it out again um, uh, or, or from their actual website, it's great. And just shows the amazing, diddly different things that you can do with this anatomy. And a lot of those different um, skills uh, crop up in all kinds of different languages. It's an amazing thing. OK, um, so we just uh, get back to PowerPoint here. Uh, right, and I also want to um, draw your attention to this, and I'm going to attempt to do this live. There's a fantastic website uh, called Pink Trombone, and it's a simulation of the moving vocal tract. Um, and you just go to this website, you click on it, and you will uh, you can generate sound. So I'm going to now do that, uh, which requires a little bit of jiggery pokery here. And here we are at the website, and I'm just going to demonstrate a couple of little things but you might want to play with this a lot it's quite amazing all the different things you can do so you can see i'm moving the tongue around Turbulence. Right, we'll stop that. So, um, have a play with that. It's great fun. Sorry about the clicking. That's, I think, my, my uh, poor laptop here's processor is struggling a bit with everything that's running to make this video. Um, but anyway, have a have play with that. If so, if you uh, if you're not familiar with the you know the basic principles of how the mouth is generating sound, it's a it's a great way to figure it out. Okay, so okay, so that's speaking. Let's now quickly move on to hearing and the auditory system. So what's going on here? Well, uh, like the uh, um, vocal tract it, it's uh, you know developed for many different things um, many animals have ears and, and of course you know huge um, e uh, evolutionary advantage of being able to sense your acoustic environment and to localize sound and you know know where a predator is coming from but also of course it's used for communication um, and what does it do well it's mainly doing frequency analysis um, and there are three uh, key percepts uh, that emerge from that, which is that uh, we, we tend to hear sa sounds which are repetitive. We tend to um, perceive a pitch. We perceive the loudness, of course, which is actually logarithmically related to the sound pressure level. 
and we perceive the tarbra, which is the sort of shape of the sound. And so that relates to what we were just seeing a moment ago with different energy at different frequencies. Um, it's worth pointing out that perceived pitch doesn't always correspond to the fundamental frequency of a complex sound. Pitch perception is a whole research area in its own right. It's very interesting what uh, humans uh, are doing there. Um, so just be aware um, that if you use the word pitch of a voice, you, you're, you need to be careful because if you're implying that you're talking about the fundamental frequency of vibration, that may not be the, uh, the actual pitch that's perceived. It's too complex a subject to go into here, but uh, that's why I'm flagging up a warning. OK, so this is the um, auditory, the anatomy of the auditory apparatus in, in a human. And we've basically got three main components here. So the outer ear and the pinna um, you'll be familiar with from your own. Um, and you might wonder, why, why are all these weird convoluted shapes? Well, it turns out that that is actually um, uh, set up to allow you to do a direction finding. Um, obviously, with two ears, you can you can tell whether something is to the left or right. But with the shape of your uh, pinna, you can determine the the azimuth, whether whether a sound is uh, above or below you, or behind or in front. Um, uh, so that that's um, quite interesting. People don't fully you know appreciate why you have this funny shape here. So that's the outer ear. Um, then we have the uh, middle ear. So uh, the middle ear is, is basically there because the what's coming up, which is the inner ear, is a liquid medium. And we've got to do transduction between vibrations in air to vibrations in liquid. And that um, has, is quite a, a difficult impedance matching problem. So it's solved using mechanical levers. So there's a bunch of little bones in there. In fact, the smallest bone in the body is in your middle ear. Um, and they are mechanical levers, which are uh, 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 facilitating very efficient transfer of energy from air vibration to liquid vibration. Um, I've also mentioned there it's, there's overload protection. So if you've ever been subject to, sub subject to a, a very loud noise and you've noticed that afterwards you can't, you know, hearing is a bit muffled, that's because you've actually got little muscles inside your middle ear, which pull those three, uh, there are three bones, it pulls them apart and therefore reduces the transmission of sound. And that's to avoid damage to the inner ear, because the inner ear is very sensitive. So this is the inner ear. Um, and we'll, we'll look at this in a little bit more detail in a moment. So this is where we do liquid to neural transduction. So remember, the whole, the, the whole idea here for the human ear is to take energy that's uh, in the uh, vibrating air and transmit some information to the brain. So we're going via liquid vibrations in liquid to then vibrations in uh, nerve fibers um, uh, so it's very complex and interesting structure but essentially it's equivalent to a bank of bandpass filters so what that means is it's doing a frequency analysis because it's um, the it's sensitive to where in the structure the vibrations are taking place all this will be explained here so this is a very nice little video <coughs> which i'll play you which kind of explains very neatly what's going on in the uh, human cochlea. So the cochlea is a sort of snail-like structure. So it's been rolled out just to make it clear what's going on.
So um, that was obviously in the end uh, quite a complex sound um, and you could see how the effect of that snail-like structure, the cochlea, is to decompose that complex sound into its different spectral components. And then the hair cells, which are the neural detectors, are spread along the length of that uh, membrane and they are then sending information to the brain as to where the vibrations are, and that's leading to your perception of the timbre of the sound. Okay, so um, now if we're looking at speech through uh, that kind of analysis, then essentially it's a equivalent to a, a sort of spectrogram. Remember, the spectrogram is a time, frequency, amplitude plot. And what we're looking at here is um, a spectrogram. It's known as, it's a, this is actually a wideband spectrogram. Um, of a piece of speech, the new bricks fell over. <clears throat> and we can see some patterns in here. So if you're not familiar with spectrograms, then uh, that's why we're looking at this. Um, so what you can see is a lot of vertical striations, right? Uh, all those vertical lines correspond, e each vertical line corresponds to a closure of the vocal folds. So remember the vocal folds are being pushed apart and clapping together. So every time they come together, there's energy goes through the whole system. And that's what you're seeing in the spectrogram there. That's what those vertical striations are. OK, now you can also see these big black horizontal-ish lines. Those are the formant resonances, right? So that's corresponding to what's going on in the oral and nasal cavities. So these are the resonances of your upper, upper vocal tract and uh, allowing energy through at particular frequencies. Um, so, now, the, uh, I mentioned this is a wideband spectrum. So what we're using here is a short time analysis window, uh, which means we've got excellent time resolution. That's why we can see the individual uh, coming together of the vocal folds. But the frequency selectivity is rather poor. Okay, it's a trade. There's a time frequency trade-off here which is inherent in this analysis. So this is a wideband speech spectrogram. Um, and so you remember earlier I was talking about harmonics of pitch, uh, harmonics of the uh, vocal fold vibration. Um, and you can't see them here because this is a wideband analysis. So let's look, therefore, at a um, different picture. <clears throat> Same speech. OK, then the bricks fell over. But this is a narrowband spe uh, speech spectrogram. So in order to do this computation, we've got a long time analysis window. So that's giving us very good frequency selectivity, but rather poor time resolution. And we can see that because now we don't, we've no longer got those vertical striations. We've now got horizontal striations. And those horizontal lines are indeed harmonics of the fundamental frequency fx. You can still see the uh, formants, but they're a bit more smeary uh, because of uh, the analysis now. So we have a choice here. When we're doing time frequency analysis in a spectrogram, we have a choice as to what time window analysis window we use. And that is going to have a direct impact on the kinds of information that is coming through our system and we may or may not want some of that information so i have seen many recent papers taking spectrograms as input with no specification of what that spectrogram is and unless the window size is given it's completely underspecified and so that means that you know replicating experiments would be impossible so that's a very strong warning now, I sort of hinted about uh, that that was, you know, the kind of information that's in the ear, but actually it's not. Um, uh, the sort of spectrogram we get using uh, sort of conventional si signal processing um, is on the top there. That's a wideband spectrogram. Um, and the sentence here is, they enjoy it when I audition. <clears throat> but at the, the lower spectrogram is a cochleogram. So this is the kind of image that the human hearing system appears to have. And you'll notice they're quite different. Now, the scales are the same, but you'll notice that the uh, cochleogram has more or less has a logarithmic scale, whereas typically we would plot a linear scale um, in, in just uh, computing a spectrogram. 
Okay, so first of all, there is a, a different frequency relationship. Um, the human ear appears to put a lot more emphasis on lower frequencies than higher frequencies, um, is the implication there. But what we can also see is that in the cochleogram, we have resolved harmonics. So that means that in, in, in the ear, we're essentially doing narrowband analysis at low frequencies, but not at high frequencies. At high frequencies, we can see the vertical, vertical striations. So the information about what's going on in the larynx is actually coming through at, both, at all frequencies, but it's coming through in different ways. So it's really important to appreciate this is what the ear is doing. And then when we're building algorithms and on top of this, we, we need to be thinking very carefully of what kind of information we, we, we're trying to get at. So I'm now going to um, finish off this bit with just a quick demonstration of some real-time speech analysis. And uh, I, to do that, I'm using a, 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 a piece of um, a program that's running on my Mac here called Feature, um, which is really neat. Um, so I'm going to click that and then that and hopefully you can see that and I so we've got a real-time spectrogram running here um, as I'm speaking uh, you can immediately see uh, lots of horizontal lines so that tells you that this is a um, narrowband analysis so just to orient you let me make some simple sounds to start with so let me just whistle and Okay, so that just uh, orient you to the uh, time frequency analysis here. And as I'm speaking, you can see different things going on. And by now, if you hadn't fully appreciate what's going on when somebody's speaking, um, uh, then if I make a sound with a constant pitch, ah, uh, reasonably constant, you see more or less horizontal lines. And if I change the pitch, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, then you see those horizontal lines moving. Um, as opposed to if I change my oral cavity and make different uh, sounds, I will change the shaping, but I can keep the pitch the same. So this would be something like <clears throat> e -a, e -a, e -a, e -a. So the pitch is not changing, but you can see the formats moving around. And while I'm speaking, you see all kinds of things going on. So if I make a, a sound like an S, or a, an explosion like a t, t, speech. One, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. Okay. So that brings us to our first break. And um, we will stop there, if you want, and carry on momentarily. <laughs> 